All right, so before we start, does anybody have any questions about the paper? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, today today is precise midterm. Right? This is the exact midpoint of semester. You know, yeah, like feels, it feels like somehow fitting that it's on the 13th. Yeah, there we go. Oh, and there I go dropping dropping the marker. So Uh huh. Yes? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I didn't even think about that. I wasn't even going to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Were we supposed to do it on the urban industrialization? Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. That, yeah. So, so yeah, what, what we're looking at over the next couple of sessions is, you know, like increasing urbanization and industrialization in uh, British life and culture. They are today, right? Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> so what have you got? Well, might as well start with you then. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I did the timeline. I didn't kind of like the dates. I don't really get that, so I have all the dates. Okay. Um, the first one I have was Thomas Malkin's, uh, who's the author, essay on the principle of population. Okay. I think that population grows on exponential rate or through population increases a little bit quickly. And by that population growth without reproduction, Spencer is actually the one who gives us the phrase survival of the fittest, not Charles Darwin. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it comes from uh, Spencer's theory of social Darwinism. Um, essentially, you know, that human societies work like Darwin's concept of nature, where the um, organisms best fitted to adapt are the ones that survive and reproduce, right? Um, but yeah, we're, gonna, we're actually going to talk a little bit about Malthus today, so I'm glad you brought him up. All right, so Bethany, what have you got? Can I bring my Monday? I was working on a paper last night and forgot about the paper. Okay, Caroline, what have you got? Okay, so just to make sure, um, I did the industrialization, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so first public railway opened in 1825. Okay, good. Also relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, it ran from Stockton to Darlington, built by George Stevens. Mm -hmm. Okay, then in 1837, British inventors William Cook and Charles Wheatstone patented the first commercial tele telegraphy. Telegraphy. Tele <laughs> yeah, it's telegraph, but it's, it's got a Y at the end, so I mean, I'm just going to telegraph It's not weird. Okay, system. Anyway, this system would be used for the railroad uh -huh. signaling the speed of the new transportation. Okay. Okay, and then 1764, James Hargraves was credited as an inventor of the multiple spinning jenny. Uh -huh. This machine was increased. The thread production counts initially eightfold. Um, he, there was somebody else who was also like credited by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Surprise! I didn't really look into like credibility. But anyway, yeah. Um, by 1770, James Hargraves was able to patch. Yeah, and I, 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 and I think that who, who, who actually built the first one? probably matters less than the larger implications of the invention of machines like the spinning jenny, right? So like the first great strides in, industrializ in industrialization um, in Europe are in the textile industry, making clothes, right? Making fabrics. 
So you know you have these processes that used to take several people kind of working at home on a loom very slowly. You can suddenly do these with a machine with a lot fewer people very, very quickly, right? So, you, so these, these new machines like the spinning jenny can help produce much more, and the, the uh, Richard Arkwright's power loom, which comes along a little bit later, you, know, you can produce a lot more material, a lot more fabric, um, and thus also make it cheaper, right? Which means that you can make these fabrics available to a wider, you know, to, to a wider variety of people. Um, but it also means they become more disposable, right? Yeah. So more people are throwing shit out because it becomes cheaper and it's less, less valuable, right? Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing kind of like, like the beginnings at the end of the 18th century of our consumer throwaway society, right? Where many of our needs are met by machines and because we can mass produce things so easily, um, we often don't think much about the consequences of throwing those things away, right? You know, what's going to happen to them um, or to, you know, to the environment when we just kind of toss stuff in the way. So there are two major intellectual and cultural revolutions going on in Britain by the end of the 18th century that have bearing on what we're talking about today. There's an agricultural revolution and an industrial revolution running more or less concurrently. So in the 18th century, and everybody knows that 18th century means 1700s, right? Okay. Sometimes people get confused on that point, so I just want to make sure. All right. There's a huge increase in agricultural output. in England and Wales. And this is due um, to a couple of factors. Some of these factors are technological, right? So here we see like a direct relationship between the Industrial Revolution and the Agricultural Revolution. Some of it has to do with better equipment, practices. So for example, a plow was invented that required um, only one, only two oxen or two horses to pull it rather than a team of four, right? So you could do a lot more plowing with fewer animals, fewer resources, and fewer workers. Um, people also began doing crop rotation. Um, does anybody know what crop rotation means? I know this is a big farming area, right? So yeah, Jess, what's crop rotation? Uh, it's essentially just using different pots of land at different points of the year to make sure there's enough nutrients in the soil to um, have a good practice. Right, yeah, because if you just let the field lie fallow, right, for a season, then soil erosion takes a lot of the nutrients away. So if you just leave a field empty for too long, it becomes less fertile, right? So what farmers started doing in the 18th century was, you know, they plant, um, you know, say, yeah, they, yeah, or um, probably not soybeans so much in England in the 18th century. What they might do is like they plant like, you know, wheat in the summer and then, you know, um, turnips in the winter or something like that, right? like in the same field so that it, you know, so the, the nutrients remained in the soil. Um, you also have things like the seed drill, which allowed you, like, instead of just tossing seeds onto the uh, onto the earth and hoping that they took, um, you could actually you were actually kind of efficiently making little lines of holes in the ground that you'd fill with seed and then cover up to make sure that more of your crop sprouted. Right. So all of this stuff together um, helps to produce 
much more um, agricultural output, right? While requiring fewer workers. Now, another thing that changed rural life in Britain irrevocably did contribute to increased agricultural output and pushing people off of the land, which seems a little bit paradoxical, right? But remember that these better equipment, the, the better equipment and different practices also meant you need fewer people, you needed fewer people to farm, right? So the other thing that started happening, um, Parliament passed a series of what were called enclosure acts. So if you lived in an 18th century village, you probably had in the middle of the village a village green, right? Or a village common. Yeah, did I already talk about this? We were go over this. Okay, good. I'm, I sometimes get mixed up between which classes I told what. <laughs> All right, so just making sure we didn't do this in this class. Okay. Um, so there would be like a village common that everybody in the village was allowed to use, right? You could grow some subsistence crops on it for your own use. If you had a sheep or a cow, you could graze them on the village common, right? So. The people who own the land decided eventually that this was an unproductive use. And so they decided they were going to fence off these village commons and use them uh, for some kind of intensive agriculture. They were either going to plant a crop there or you know, put livestock there, raise livestock there. So with less work to do on farms, and um, fewer opportunities to like, kind of develop your own kind of subsistence economy, uh, people started leaving rural villages in droves, right? Rural England kind of emptied out. And this contributes a great deal to the growth of cities in this period. And to, to like, you'll, you'll see a, a lot of um, writing in this period also, but kind of like the desolation of rural areas um, and deserted villages. You also had with the advent of the railway faster ways to get your crops to market. So you didn't have to take a whole day to schlep your stuff on a cart up to the market town. You know, you could just you know, if there, if there was a nearby railway station, you could just ship it that way. And railways actually, railways and factories end up revolutionizing modern life in ways that we often don't recognize. So this is actually probably a good place to shift to talking about the Industrial Revolution, which as we noted, right, started with textiles. And work that had been done either as cottage industries in people's homes or by skilled artisans was being replicated by machines. So this is another factor that led to uh, massive growth of cities, especially in the north of England. So cities like Birmingham and Manchester, for example, grow exponentially during this period. Because these are the places where a lot of these mills are located. Um, and this also leads to um, a lot of crowding and unhealthy, unsanitary conditions. The other thing that factories and the railway contribute to is the way we think about time. For the average rural laborer who just kind of does a day's work on the farm, How much does time matter? A lot. 
Why? Because, like, it depends on, like, time of year or whatever. Uh huh. Because of the sun going down quicker. Once it gets dark, you can't see anything, you can't be work. Yeah. So, you have to get up really, really early. Mm -hmm. Right when the sun gets up. Yep. And you have to get up. So, you have, to, you have to take advantage of every hour of daylight, right? Every but, second. Yeah, but generally in the winter, when there is less daylight, there's also less work to do around the farm, right? Um, so, you're much more concerned with these larger seasonal cycles than you are with counting down the hours, right? Particularly if you aren't paid hourly, right? If it's your farm, for example. Then breaking time up into these kind of distinct units doesn't really make that much difference, right? It's not the way you tend to think about it. You tend to think, okay, I get up with the sun, and then when the sun goes down, I come in, I eat my dinner, and I go to bed, right? You know, rinse and repeat the following day. Things are very, very different for a factory worker who is paid by the hour, right? Now time has a monetary value attached to it. And your employer is very much concerned with making sure that he is getting his maximum value from you. So if he's paying you by the hour, you have to be in at a certain time and out at a certain time, and you have to be counting these particular units of time in which you are being paid, right? So this is really when we start thinking, like, of course there were, you know, hours existed before, the concept of the hour existed before this, right? But it didn't really matter very much, except for, like, when monks would say their prayers and shit like that. Um, Dividing the day up into distinct units of 24, 60 minute periods, right? That's kind of a new thing during the Industrial Revolution. And the railway helps contribute to that as well, because, you know, if you're waiting for it, like, you go to wait for a train, right? You expect it to be there on time. You expect it to be, like, you don't want to, like, sit or, like, you, you can't just kind of vaguely hope, okay, well, you know, the train will be there sometime after sunrise, right? So the trains have to run on a particular schedule, and that schedule has to be standardized across the system and right, across the country. So, whereas before, you know, every, you know, town in Britain, every different little village in Britain might have had its own church clock by which they kept the hours. Now, with the advent of the railway, everybody's got to get on the same time, right? So time is standardized nationally and actually has a monetary value attached to it. Now, this will probably be less important for what we're talking about today than it will be for thinking about what's going on in a Christmas carol next time, right? But into all of this comes this gentleman that Jess met, uh, mentioned, Thomas Malthus. Right, so Malthus, in 1798, wrote an essay demonstrating essentially that no matter what we do, population grows faster than food resources. And so within a few generations, we will not be producing enough food to feed the entire population. Now, Malthus also believed that allowing things like birth control and late marriage led people to vice. So his only real suggestion for dealing with this problem is letting people starve to death, right? Essentially, letting nature... Um, yeah, yeah, letting nature kill off the poor, basically. Um, because he also regards any kind of redistribution of resources as you know, unnatural and thus... Um, Vicious, as he puts it. Um, but um, you know, Malthus's thinking uh, kind of becomes highly influential um, in this period, particularly when it comes with developing policies to deal with um, the amount of poverty that is created um, by the people who are left out of the good parts of these revolutions. Right? You know, the people who are maybe kind of forced off of the village they always lived in by an enclosure, 
they go to the city, maybe they find jobs in the factory, but the jobs don't pay that well, the hours are long, the work is hard, and the whole family is expected to work, right? Mother, father, and children. Everybody, right? What's that? Yeah, yeah, which, you know, and again, I think like one thing that we have to consider too when we talk about child labor is that to a 19th century person, for the most part, there's nothing unnatural or horrifying about that, right? We are shocked and upset by it. But, you know, to the, you know, to the romantics, the Victorians, it was just normal. There are individual people who are outraged by it and who rail against it. But they're not the norm, right? They're outside of the mainstream, typically. Um, and it's really not until about the end of the 19th century that child labor is actually abolished anywhere. Right? It's, actually, it's abolished in Britain before it's abolished here. And oftentimes, the people who were most vehemently against abolishing child labor were the working classes whose children had to go to work because they were worried about how they were going to make up for the lost income. And so, you know, it's, it's all well for you, you know, middle class parliamentarian to tell me that my child shouldn't be working, but what are you going to do to put food on my table, right? So, I want to give you a map of England with a couple of key locations marked out here. So one thing that we see is the locations that are most associated with each of the three poets that you read for today, right? So we have um, in the north of England, uh, the Lake District in Cumbria, which is where Wordsworth lived and wrote for much of his career. In the extreme southeast, we have London, where William Blake lived. He uh, was born and died there, and lived pretty much his entire life in London. And to the north of London is the rural community of Peterborough, where, which uh, was where John Clare came from. Now, these other places I've marked off were some of the big industrial centers of the Revolution. We'll find that most of them are in the north. There's a big divide between the north of England, which industrializes, and the south of England, which remains predominantly rural for a long time, that actually kind of persists into the present. Because even though the north is making lots of money in this period, or at least the people who own the mills are making lots of money, um, they're not accumulating political power. The political power is so largely in the south of You'll notice that there's one city in Scotland that I've also noted here, just sort of above the map. Uh, Glasgow was also a major industrial center. So let's actually start with urban Britain and with William Blake. And I've got two handouts here, which are the two versions of Blake's poem, The Chimney Sweeper, as originally published. And if there are extras, just hand them over. Thank you. And thank you. So let me explain in the first place why Blake wrote two poems called The Chimney Sweeper. So Blake's first published volume of poetry was called Songs of Innocence. And Songs of Innocence is concerned largely with, again, the kinds of ideas that we associate you know, with innocence, with lack of experience, um, childhood. Right, uncomplicated happiness or joy, like friendship and love.
freedom, things of that nature. Now, shortly thereafter, he publishes a companion volume called Songs of Experience. And most of the poems in Songs of Experience speak back to Songs of Innocence. But from the perspective of someone who knows the world a little better, right? Someone who has experience. So the, the songs of, these songs of experience are typically much darker in tone. Right? Often ominous. And they often directly reference poems from songs and songs of experience, right? So in Songs of Innocence, for example, you have a poem called The Land. You know, which it describes, you know, a cute, cute little fleecy lamb frolicking about in the fields, you know, that asks the question, you know, you know, little lamb who made thee. And the analog to it in Songs of Experience is the tiger. Spelled by Blake and Y, because why not? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. And all thy fe fearful symmetry, did he who made the lamb make thee, right? What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, well, just that part of it. <laughs> I, you know, I, I read a lot of poetry. It's, it's, it's part of my job. But yeah, so you know, so the tiger and the lamb being you know, two completely different kinds of the kinds of animal, both you know made by the same hand, right? And I think there, there's a similar thing here going on in the two versions of the chimney sweeper, right? And again, I want to remind everybody too that these are Blake's own illustrations, right? That Blake was professionally speaking an engraver. That was how he made his money. So all of his poems are published on engraved plates. So let's look at the first version here. What's about ominous? Ominous? Darker. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So can I get somebody to read uh, the first version of Jimmy Sweeper, starting with when my mother died, I was very young. When my mother died, I was very young. My father told me, Scarcely cry, we believe we believe. So your chimney is sweet. It's so nice <laughs> There's little Tom. Dagger. Dagger. Who cried in his head that. You know what? Because this is a little harder. Why don't we just go to the yeah. version that's in the that's in the book? I mean, it's it, it's it's exactly the same text. It's page one thirty one, and then we'll we'll talk we'll, we'll talk about it in light of the picture that's at the bottom here. So this is a poem about a child worker, right? 
but this is the version that is from Songs of Innocence. What's innocent about this poem? Doing a What's that? He's young and he's doing a dangerous job. Okay, he's young. He is doing a dangerous job, but does he seem particularly conscious of the danger? In fact, Yeah, what? Well, yeah, the job probably doesn't make him happy, right? He's doing it to make someone happy. Oh, to make someone happy, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're, we're to, to emphasize the use of the chimney sweeper here, right? Of course, you know, that when, you know, he was, my father sold me when yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So, the weep, weep. has a double meaning here, right? On the one hand, the literal meaning within the line is it's a contraction of sweep, right? So, you know, a chimney sweep would go down the streets saying sweep, sweep, sweep in order to drum up business, right? You know, hey, you need a chimney sweep, right? Here I am. But without the S, it's weep, weep, right? So he's too young when sold into this profession to even really understand that he should be upset about it, right? He's too young to cry, weep, 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 weep. And probably though, and, and you know, we have his, uh, you know, his associate here, Tom Dacre, whose hair curls like a lamb. Right, so associated there with that particular symbol of innocence. And then what's what's weird about Tom's dream? It's like they all died. All yeah. The what? Died. Yeah. What, what suggests to you of all the chimney sweeps dying? Coffins. Yeah, the coffins of black. Right. Now, what might the coffins of black that they're all locked up in? What element of their day-to-day -day lives might these represent? Chimney. Yeah, these are chimneys, exactly. The coffins of black are chimneys. Good. And what happens to all of these children, Dick, Joe, Ned, and Jack? Okay, what, what suggests to you that they died? Okay, well, like, just kind of tell me how you got them. Like, what suggests that they died on the job? <laughs> yeah, the coffins all, yeah, they're, they're literally chimneys, but the coffins suggest death, right? Death and burial. And what else in the following stanza also suggests death? Page 131. Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening here is this kind of promise of a joyful afterlife, right? Okay, yeah, maybe, you know, being a chimney, being a child chimney sweep sucks, right? But there is a promise that we will all be able to frolic. Um, you know, naked and white, all our bags left behind, right? You know, free in you know, when we die, right? So there is a kind of the joy in this poem and the innocence in this poem is not unmixed with sorrow here, right? With potential sorrow. Although it's actually fairly common. For poems that criticize child labor in this period and in the, in the early Victorian period to suggest that the children would prefer to die than to keep going to work. That death is actually a happier state for them, right? That this is a kind of release from worldly suffering. 
You know, the angel told Tom if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy, right? never lack for joy. So these children in this song of innocence are holding on to the promise of a better afterlife, right? Now let's look at the image associated with this, right? What do you see going on here in the, the picture here at the bottom? It's a little, it's a little fuzzy because important, I'm sorry, the copy quality that I gave you isn't all that good. Yeah, it's a bunch of kids dancing and there's an angel pulling one up, right? So you have a group of children dancing together in a green field. Now, if we go to the other handout that I gave you, which depicts the version from Songs of Experience, what do we notice is different in the picture? It's solemn. Pardon? It's solemn. Okay, well, what, what makes it look more solemn? The kid looks like he's real depressed. Okay, you got a sad looking kid with a bag slung over his shoulder, and his chimney sweeper tools. Pardon? Is it raining? Yeah, it's raining. What about the location is different, apart from the rain? It's not a happy dancing field, it's now on a street. Yeah, he's walking down a street, right? A wet street. And what else is different? There's one more important difference here. How is this child different from the children in the other picture? Reality. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, the song of experience, right? So, stripping away any kind of pleasant illusions. But there's one very, very important thing you haven't hit yet. With that little box in the back of What's that? The little box in the back of the uh, It is not. Okay. <laughs> He's carrying, okay, he is carrying his chimney sweep bag. So, who else is around here? He's alone. He's alone, well, exactly. I thought, I thought you heard me say that. Oh, I didn't, no, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't I did, I'm sorry, I did not realize that you actually had hit that. <laughs> but yeah, he's, this, in this one, the child is alone, right? And in the poem as well, there's no mention here of other children. Right? just of authority figures who have failed him. So can I get somebody to read on page 137, The Chimney Sweeper? Little black thing among the snow, crying leap, leap in notes of woe. Why are thy father and mother say? They are both gone up to the church to pray, because I was happy upon the heat and smiled, and smiled among the winter snow. They clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think they have done me no injury. And are gone to praise God in his grace and pain, and make up a heaven of our misery. Yes, sir. Yes. This is a lot like the other poem that there's a sadness in it, right? There's a sadness that's tempered by that kind of, you know, the happy vision, right? Is there any happy vision of any sort in this poem? Yeah, again. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this, this is a kid that's had all his, illusion, all his illusions stripped away, right? That sees nothing but a probably short lifetime of bleak toil ahead, right? So I think where I really want to focus here is on that last stanza and where he lays the blame for this, right? Is this kid an orphan? No. I thought he was, but I could be one. Okay, what made you think he was an orphan? Because they are both gone. I know it says up to the church to pray, mm -hmm. but that could still mean that they were gone. In the first poem, it said his father sold him. Yeah, mother's dead, father sold him, yeah. Because it could be a lie. 
Uh huh. So you think that, that that could be? It's like you know, m mother and father said they were going to church and never came back. Right. Okay. So yeah. So this is someone who's been failed by his parents, right? And with what other authority figures does he associate his parents? Yeah, right, they are gone to praise God and his priest and king. And I think that one thing that we have to remember too about any references to the church in the late 18th century Britain Right. What do we remember? What do we know the church was a branch of? What's that? Not in England, right? Yeah, we're talking about the Anglican Church, right? Right. More specifically, the Church of England, right? And who's the head of the Church of England? The king. Yeah, the, the, whoever the monarch happens to be, right? So yeah, the king or queen is the head of the Church of England. So when we talk about God as priest and king, right, it's a failure of both church and state to actually do anything to step in and protect this child, right? Because they're kind of one entity here. Also that Henry VIII could get a divorce. So here, like the happy religious vision doesn't happen here. Right? The idea of, you know, God becoming the little boy's loving father if he's good doesn't happen because the child doesn't trust any of these authority figures now, right? Places no trust in anything. And I think that we can see like this kind of suspicion of church and state in Blake. Um, kind of generally, right? I just want to take a kind of brief look at London on page 141 um, about uh, Blake's own home city. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls, right? So in this stanza, he is connecting church and state again, right? Something shameful he sees about both, right? The church not doing enough about child poverty and the state wasting lives and wars, right? So let's turn from Blake's really pretty bleak vision of what urban life is becoming in the late 18th century um, to Wordsworth and one of his many celebrations of rural life in the Solitary Reaper, page 352. Page what? So one thing that we should note about Wordsworth before we proceed with this particular poem educated gentleman who knows how to keep a garden but doesn't really know how to work a farm right or really understand much about you know the actual subsistence farming practices of you know real genuine peasants right so Wordsworth is you know he's really into particularly early in his career celebrating 
the language of the people he perceives as the common man, right? And the, pe the rural peasant. But he probably wouldn't know a real peasant if one walked up and bit him on the ass. So Wordsworth's descriptions of rural life, the, the, you know, the reason I say this, you know, to mock poor Wordsworth, who is in some ways eminently mockable, but is also a brilliant poet, um, is that Wordsworth's poems about rural life are always at a certain distance or remove, right? There's something about it that he doesn't quite get. And he never quite, he, he can never get quite close enough to the subject of the poem to fully understand it, right? He can observe it and be kind of entranced by it, but he, can, he never seems to fully understand it, right? So can I get somebody to read The Solitary Reaper for us? And then we'll talk about the situation he's describing and what he's doing here. The whole person in the field, young solitary reaper, Fancy way of saying chant. Yeah. <laughs> More welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shade, shady home. Among Arabian sands, a voice so thrilling near was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird, breaking the silence of the sea among the farthest Hebrides. Will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive number flood for old unhappy far off things, the battles long ago. Or it is some more humble way, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow falls for pain that has been and may be again. Whatever the thing the maiden sang as if her soul could have no ending. I saw her singing at her work. And for the sick of ending, I listened, motionless and still. And as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore long after it was heard. All right, thank you. So, what's the situation that's described in the poem? What's going on here? He watches her. What's that? He watches her. He's watching this lady walk by or work. Yeah, he's watching a woman work, right? He's watching a young Scottish woman reaping alone in a field while she sings, right? What's that? Maybe a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so I think it's important yet to know here that she is apparently alone, right? And she's singing. Now, is there anything weird about her being alone doing this kind of work? Yeah, the idea of somebody yeah, reap, like reaping their harvest alone seems suspect here in terms of authenticity, right? Um, this is something that typically requires many hands. Right. And by suspicious, right, I mean not that we should be suspicious of the reaper herself, but suspicious of Wordsworth, um, who might be making up or romanticizing a particular incident, right? <laughs> Now, what do we know about her singing? Or what does Wordsworth note about her singing? Well, she's singing about sad things, and he's not 
sandwiches. Yeah, that's the big that's the big kicker here, right? He doesn't understand the language she's singing, and she's singing in Scots Gaelic, right? So he doesn't know what the content of the song is, right? Which, you know, he eventually admits, right? Oh, will, will someone tell me what she sings, right? So yeah, Wordsworth doesn't speak her language in more ways than one. So he has no idea what she's singing, but he's enchanted by the sound, right? So we have here this kind of divide between the sound of poetry or song versus the sense, right? And that is the, the literal meaning of words. And he's emphasizing here in particular the beauty of the sound. Right, he says she sings a melancholy strain, right? So he says it's, so it essentially kind of sounds sad to him, right? But again, he can't know whether it's a sad song or not. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, if it's, if it's just in a minor key, then it's gonna sound melancholy, right? And if we look at some of the things he compares her to, right? No nightingale that ever chomps, more welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. So the nightingale is a bird that is often used as a kind of figure or metaphor for the poet. But I think perhaps what's even kind of more important here than what, what he imagines her as is kind of where he imagines her singing her song. Right? To travelers in some shady haunts among Arabian sands, right? So he is kind of making something, something exotic out of this simple work song. And making something exotic out of her at the same time, right? The next bird that he compares her to is the cuckoo. And what do we know about the cuckoo? If anything, what's weird about the cuckoo? How does it lay its eggs? Nobody knows? Okay, so the coo cuckoos don't build their own nests. What they do is find existing nests that other birds have built, lay their eggs there, and then their larger, stronger chicks push the other chicks out of the nest and, you know, essentially get all the feed from the foster parent bird, right? So cuckoos are these kind of like changeling birds, right? They don't raise their own children. They're like, they're, they, they, they're, always, they're always alien in whatever nest they find themselves in, if this makes sense. So you know, she's a nightingale, she's a cuckoo, she associates her with the Arabian sands and the Hebrides. The Hebrides are off the coast of Scotland. So yeah, they're, they're an island chain. So these would be some kind of closer to reality, given what, he, you know, given what he's describing here, but would still be regarded by an English person as these kind of far off, you know, these kind of far off kind of exotic parts of Britain, right? So yes, he's associating her with things that he would regard as exotic or distant. And a lot of this is based on that simple inability to understand her language. Right, will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old, unhappy, far-off things in battles long ago, right? So is she singing an epic? Or is it some more humble way, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss, or pain that has been and may be again? Is it a folk ballad, right? So he's uniting both tendencies here in this single figure, right? And kind of like both the epic and a kind of higher tradition 
with a folk art or ballad tradition. And because they can't converse, he can pretty much project whatever ideas he wants to onto her, right? So that's one of the things that I find actually most troubling about this poem is that he just develops these ideas. Yeah. And just kind of like decides all these things about this woman he can't converse with. Yeah. And we can see that this is a very active imagination here, right? And of course, you know, the romantics are big on imagination, right? That's their, that's their thing. And for Wordsworth in particular, emotion recollected in tranquility. But yeah, so here, you know, we, we have like the important part of the work here for Wordsworth. And this is probably not, you know, completely out of bounds for a poet, right? The, is the work she's doing the thing that he's most interested in? Yeah, it's the song that accompanies it, right? The reaping itself, I point to exhibit A here, right? <laughs> but the song, that's something he, like that's something that's close to his own realm of experience, right? But it's just distant enough that it remains exotic. And I would suggest that it's distant in part because of the language barrier, and in part because it's a work song. And Wordsworth comes from a completely different kind of cultural tradition, right? He is not the sort of person who would have grown up singing work songs, um, you know, you know, gathering crops in a field. You know, he's. Uh, frilly cravat wearing Cambridge graduate, you know, it's It's illustrative of the kind of the gulf between him and his subject, right? Now, just want to check and see what we have for time quickly. Okay, we got a little, we got enough time for John Clare. Now I want to move from here to the work of an actual rural working class poet, right? Was that? Yeah, someone who someone who was actually like who was actually you know like stepped in cow shit, right? <laughs> well, my grandfather was a dairy farmer, and let me just you know when I look when I look for John Clare in this book, I can never find I can never find him. I'm actually looking for 902, the peasant poet. Okay. So yeah, Claire is born into a family of rural laborers in Peterborough, which is a song that map is a little ways north of London, um, and is sort of adopted. Um, for a time in the 1820s by a group of sophisticated urban romantic poets who look at him and say, oh, hey, this is the real deal, right? Let's try to nurture this guy's um, knack for observing rural life and get him to write a bunch of rural poetic sketches. Um, but much of what Claire wrote his editors, in particular a guy named John Taylor, felt the need to edit and correct. So much that was authentic in Claire's voice that didn't match with uh, what's called received pronunciation, right? That is kind of I guess what we also call the Queen's English, right? But that did match his own local idiom. Um, people like Taylor often kind of edited out of the poems. So what we have here in the anthology are the edited versions of Claire's poems. In part because um, you know this is you know this the Norton anthology is put together for sophomore level 
um, literature classes, and the editors figured it would be much too hard for people who aren't familiar with rural English dialects um, to parse Claire's actual manuscript poems. But let's see if we can kind of get a sense, though, at what he's getting at, like what he sees as the role of, or the identity of the peasant poet in this, uh, kind of this late poem on page 902. So can I get someone to read this for us, please? He loved the brook's soft sound, the swallow swimming by. He loved the daisy covered ground, the cloud, the dappled sky. To him, the dismal storm appeared, the very voice of God. Where the evening rack was reared, stood Moses with his rod, and everything his eyes surveyed, the insects did the break. Where creatures God Almighty made, he loved them for his sake, a silent man in life's affairs, a finger from a boy, from a boy, a peasant in his daily cares, the poet in his joy. Okay, thank you, Beth. So, let's start with the word peasant. What's a peasant? What does it mean to be a peasant? Lower class. Okay, yeah. We tend to associate it with lower socioeconomic classes. What else do we associate with this word? Would we call an urban lower class person a peasant? Pardon? You would not. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, a commoner would basically... Yeah, well, you know, commoner is a term that's still used in British parlance, but a commoner is basically anybody who doesn't have an aristocratic title. So commoner covers a very, very broad, it's like just about everyone in England, right? Just about everyone in Britain is a commoner. So a peasant is just somebody who just does, like, very hard labor. Yeah. So yeah, we associate it with hard labor, and in particular, with farm labor. Yeah, peasants are the rural poor. Or the rural working class, right? So when Claire is talking about being a peasant, right, these are the ideas that that encompasses. So what do you note in his description of the peasant poet here? What does it seem to mean to him to be a peasant poet? What, what are the things that he focuses on here first? Okay, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, there's a lot here about his physical environment, right? And what is his attitude towards this physical environment? Like, what does the poem say, his attitude towards the brook soft sound, say, and the daisy covered ground is? He's in love. He loves it, yes. To him the dismal storm appeared, the very voice of God. And where the evening rack was reared, stood Moses with his rod. Now, what does this suggest you know, you know, about you know, the, you know, the dismal storm and the clouds in the sky? How, what's his, what is his attitude towards those? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's beautiful, right? But there's something, there's a deeper feeling there as well, right? You see, you know, he, that, the dismal storm appears, the voice of God. He sees Moses with his rod standing behind the clouds. It's like God is there and he's speaking to me. Yeah, it's kind of reverence, right? It means he's also associating these natural phenomena with symbols.
And you know, one thing that we have to remember too, that you know, when Claire writes this poem, started like in, in 1842, that these kind of, the kinds of places he's talking about are becoming more and more rare, at least in the inhabited parts of England. In fact, even if we look at our map, you know, the Lake District in Cumbria, where uh, Wordsworth uh, lived and worked, was you know, like is still a region of great natural beauty, but borders on several heavily industrialized areas. So just outside of this kind of pristine wilderness, where there are still, you know, few habitations apart from, you know, little picturesque villages, there are these, you know, industrial cities and, you know, now tracked suburbs that have spread as well, right? So this is, like, not just a beautiful environment, it's also, even in Claire's time, a threatened one. And everything his eyes surveyed, the insects in the brake, were creatures God Almighty made. He loved them for his sake. So now in the second half of the poem, uniting love with reverence, right? Bringing those two ideas together. A silent man in life's affairs, a thinker from a boy, a peasant in his daily cares, the poet in his joy. So let's think about this and maybe compare it to some of the stuff that we looked at when we talked about um, romantic aesthetics, right? Do we all remember what romantic poetry, by and large, is usually actually about? Natural beauty is often a part of it, right? But what is observing that natural beauty supposed to spark? Pardon? Love. Well, sometimes, sometimes love. Yeah, and in this case, the poet clearly loves what he's looking at, right? What were you, what were you saying? Yeah, you're, you're thinking along the right lines there, right? Romantic poetry is always ultimately about thinking. meditation that begins with observation of some natural phenomenon. Takes us inside the poet's head for a while and then applies these musings to his current situation. Right? And I think that, you know, this set of four identities here that are contained within one person, I think kind of related to this idea of romantic poetry being about thinking, right? So he's a silent man. A thinker. A peasant. And a poet. So we've already kind of pulled out here what peasant means, right? And we all know, I think, what a poet is as well, right? A person who writes poetry, right? But we can also kind of see that process in the earlier part of this poem, right? That the poet is not just someone who writes poems, right? But someone who sees symbolic resonance in natural phenomena and feels genuine love for the things that he observes, right? Now, why would silent man and thinker be necessary parts of this particular identity? A silent man in life's affairs 
Theoretical okay. Yeah, there, I think there is an implied politics or theory in this poem. But yeah, silent man in life's affairs, at least it's someone who maybe isn't a big arguer, right? It's, it's more interactive nature than we use in society. Yeah, in order to observe accurately, right? You gotta be quiet. Not a thinker, right? Then you don't have any material to make poetry out of. So you have to sit quietly and observe your surroundings. Make connections between things, right? Make these kinds of symbolic connections between your day to day life and your environment in order to make poetry. So I think there's a clear progression here in these four things as well, right? That each of these kind of builds on the, builds on the last. All right, does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, so for next time, remember we're gonna be doing the Dickens, we're gonna be doing a Christmas Carol. And I know that all of you have probably seen some movie version of this, right? Please read it anyway. <laughs> What's that? Is it like a hundred different movie versions? Of there, there are hundreds of different movies of of varying, of varying quality. Yes, and you know, well, you know, I, in, in in just about all things, I love the Muppets. I got you know nothing against the Muppets. There's a Muppet yeah. version. What's that? A oh, the, there is, there is a Muppet version. Yes. Yeah, I heard the, um, like Donald Duck version. Oh, like, it's uh, it, Mickey's Christmas Carol. It yeah, was, it's, but it, yeah, it's uh, like Scrooge Donald Scrooge McDuck is it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Yeah, so so, hey, I, so so yeah, just remember that if you have seen Mickey's Christmas Carol or the Muppets Christmas Carol, that doesn't mean you have read a Christmas Carol, right? <laughs>